So welcome to the Brave, Bold, Brilliant podcast. I'm your host, Jeanette Lymph, and I am here today with an incredible guest, the one and only Leon Britton. Now, Leon has appeared 536 times throughout his career, 17 goals, and has been at the top of his game. So welcome to the podcast, Leon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Great to see you. So, you know, you are very well known in the world of football, in the world of sport. um, But for anyone that by chance might not know you, (laughs) which I know is probably not, not, not in the rarity, do you want to just give us a bit of background on your story, yeah. kind of where life started for you and uh, where you're up to now? Yeah, well, life started for me in, um, I grew up in Wimbledon. Um, I was one of four children, the youngest um, of the four. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously my mum and dad lived in Wimbledon Park and then from a very young age got into football. I was, I was literally seven or eight years old. Funny enough, mum and dad wasn't big football fans. Um right. You know, dad didn't, he didn't support a team, didn't go on much games, take me to games really. But for some reason in the playground, um, I started playing football and it was actually one of the teachers who said to my mum and dad that, you know, that, that I was talented and that's something that I should pursue. And from a, young, from a young age, at eight years old, I was at Chelsea, only for one year. And then at nine to 16, I joined Arsenal, um, which, was, which was great. And in, in between at 14, I went to Lillyshaw National School. So I was away for two years of my last schooling, um, years as such. And um, from then at 16, left Arsenal, joined West Ham uh, to do my YTS, which was obviously hoping to break into the first team. And then mm-hmm. unfortunately didn't make it. And then, and then joined Swansea at, at 20 years old. And I've been here ever since, you know, for, um, like you say, a lot of games and spent the best part of 16, 17 years playing at Swansea. And... I've now retired and, and living in Swansea with my wife, who's, who's a local girl with, with, with four children. So um, they're keeping me busy in my retired life at the moment. But yeah, that's where it's all started. Obviously, it was at Wimbledon and, and the love of football from a, a very young age. Yeah, and, and interestingly what you said, that it was a teacher that spotted that talent in you. You might not have even realised it yourself. Yeah. Um, and then look at the look at the path that's taken you on by someone sort of saying, "Oh, actually, you're pretty good at this." Yeah, it's it's funny how it worked out. Like you say, it's not like Dad was a big football fan and pushed mm. pushed me and said, "Come on, you know, go and play football." It was just something that I played at Wimbledon Park Primary School. I remember just playing in in uh, in the playground. I remember playing a cup final between each other in school and it was like Nottingham Forest versus Tottenham in 1991 and I was I was playing in that and I remember the teacher I've still got the school report in um in the house my mum you know my mum keeps a lot of stuff and she's passed it on to myself and the teacher Miss Rankin was a was a, a big Everton fan um and she put in the school report that she thought I had an outstanding talent in in football I was very good at all sports but outstanding in football and it was something that my mum and dad should try and pursue and, 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 you know, push me towards like, you know, they didn't need to do that because I loved it anyway from a very young age. But it was, like you say, it's strange how from um, that young age, it was through a teacher really who who kind of see that mm-hmm. um, ability in me from, from such a young age. Yeah, yeah. So when, so when you got into football so young and then you, you know, I suppose your parents are wanting the best for you. They want you to love what you're doing, but also probably thinking, oh, actually, what about education and yeah. all of this? How did, how, how did that play out for you then? How did you manage to, to kind of be focused on the sport and yeah. on the education side of things? Well, it was, it was very difficult. I mean, it was very difficult. I think things have changed from when I was younger. I think nowadays the, you know, the, the, from nine years old, they're training literally every day at a football club. Mm. If you're at Swansea, you're training every day. Whereas when I was younger, we would train once a week, say with Arsenal, um, and then you'd play with your Sunday league team. So it wasn't probably as intense as it is now for younger younger children, if, if you like. Yeah. Um, but obviously there was always a balance in, in between, you know, training and, and, and playing and obviously schoolwork. Um, and it, it was a big sacrifice for my parents. You know, I look at my mum, she... She used to work in New Covent Garden Market, which is a fruit and veg market. She was like, you know, a secretary for a, a company and she would be up the crack of dawn, mm. you know, leave, you know, six in the morning because obviously it started early in, in the fruit and veg market when people were buying stuff. And then she'd be coming back and then driving me across London from Wimbledon to Arsenal through the traffic to take me to training, you know. So wow. it, was a, it was a huge sacrifice for, for my parents as well. But um, 
always supportive in, in football um, and schooling work. But like I say, it was, it's important that you get the balance. Mm. But it's a little bit different back then because it, school, you know, we didn't train as much. It was more playing with your friends in the park as opposed to yeah. nowadays it's very much more Monday to Friday you're training with your, your, your professional club. Yeah. When did it start getting serious for you then where you actually realised that actually this isn't just playing in the park, this is, this is a potential career for me and I am really good, I can get to the top, the top of the, you know, football. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to pinpoint an actual moment. I think, like you said, when you're young, I think I played for my Sunday league team your local team, if you like, yeah. as well as Arsenal. But I think when I stopped playing for my Sunday league team about, I think it was about 12 years old. It's a lot different now. They, nowadays, Swansea or, or the professional clubs would never let you play for your Sunday league team, whereas back then it was a bit different. But yeah. I think once I finished playing for my Sunday league team and Arsenal said, look, you can't do that no more. We're your club. We're mm. going to invest the, you know, the time into you and you have to invest that time back. I think that's when you start to realise that probably 11, 12 years old that... Um, I always wanted to be it, but then you, you start to realise this is getting a bit more serious. It's not Sunday with your friends, your local yeah. school friends or your friends from around the area. It is like, you know, everyone coming together every week from, from various parts of the country mm. to, to train at Arsenal and play. So I think 12 to 13, um, I think it started to get serious. And then I went to Liddyshaw when I was 14. So Liddyshaw was um, a national school of excellence, if you like. So they picked the supposed best 16 players in in England, so you had to start with a regional trial. From that, you, they'd take 64 players from across the country to Liddyshaw. You had a trial that narrowed it down to 32, and from 32 to 16. Wow. And it was almost like a boarding school. So you went away for your last two years, yeah. um, 14 to 16. And that's when it was really serious. And then probably when you start to think, well, I'm in the supposed best 16 in, yeah. in England. like you know, And that was, a, that was a huge achievement at the time. And then you start to think, you know, I've got a chance here maybe. Yeah, so so I guess well, there's a few things that are sort of running through my mind as you're talking. One, actually, the competitiveness and that that you know realizing that oh my gosh, there's pressure here. Mm. That this is about winning. This isn't about mediocrity. If no. I want to be at the top of my game, so so pressure at that young age must have been quite tough. Or, or did it not feel like that at the time, Leon? No, I think it was quite tough. I think. Especially when you went for the trials at Lillyshaw, because there's a chance of that rejection. You know, you go to these trials and you get to Lillyshaw, and there's 64 young lads who are competing to get into the next 32. Yeah. You go home and you're waiting for that letter, and so that competitiveness is is there from from a young age, and it's it is pressure. It is it is pressure, but I think you learn to deal with. It. You know, some some people can deal with it better um, than others, and I'd like to think at a young age I was able to to deal with it better. I guess it's it was about belief in your ability as well. You know, you know mm. I did think I had the ability to to be one of the top sixteen in the country, um, but it is it is difficult as a young as a young as a young man as such really growing up with that pressure and having to deal with it because we're all in the same boat, wanting to be the best. We all want to make it. Yeah. Fortunately, I got into that sixteen, but you know, there's there's obviously a lot of players who who didn't make it and have to deal with that rejection, and, and some maybe never never recover from that. Mm. Yeah, interesting because dealing with rejection, failure, all of these things, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're in sport, business, in life, you know, not everything's going to go go right, is it? No, no, we wish it did, but it doesn't, does it? But that's, it just doesn't. That's part of everyone's journey. It's yeah. dealing with rejection and, and how you deal with it and dealing with success as well. Like, you know, it's not just the rejection, it's success as well and how you deal with it and not let it get to your head. Um, so it's very difficult, especially at a young age, you know, I feel sorry for the, you know, the, the say the kids in sport now football clubs when they get the rejection and how it can affect them it has a because everyone wants to be a footballer you know in terms of when you're in that in that yeah you know in that sport you want to you want to be the best you want to be a footballer and dealing with that rejection it can really have a massive effect on on not just their confidence in sport but obviously their confidence yeah. outside of um outside of sport as well it can really knock them back so um it is about how you deal with it and it, you know it's difficult when you're a young child as such and that pressure and you you're wanting to be the best did, uh, did did you get rejections at that point or was it that you were on a trajectory of just kind of, you know, uh, performing and just kind of going up and up and up or did you get rejections through that period? Not in that period, if, I, if I'm being honest. Um, yeah. I was, I say I was fortunate. I went, I was at Arsenal, I was at a big club and then obviously I got to Lillyshaw. I guess the, the, not rejection, but the one thing, big, big thing I had to deal with at Lillyshaw was when I went there for my first year, I suffered with a stress fracture in my back. Right. So I couldn't train for... Um, 
it was about four months, four or five months. Right. So you're away from home. Obviously, you're going to live in, it was in Shropshire. So obviously, you're going mm. away at 14, which is a big step, you know, as it is. Um, but the reason you're going there is because at the time, like I said you trained at Arsenal once a week. When you went to Liddyshaw, you trained every day, yeah. which was the difference. Okay. Um, but there I was there in the first four to five months, having to be away from home, dealing with a stress fracture when the other 15 boys were going out to train. And I was there, you know, just watching or, mm. you know, inside. And that was, say, rejection, but dealing with, you know, that situation was, was, was tough um, at that moment because, like I say, the whole reason I went there was to, to, to go and train and, and, and obviously not doing that, being away from home, being away from your family yeah. and your friends yeah. was, was a difficult moment, at, you know, at a young age for me. So, but in part, you know, in terms of trajectory, I was, I was doing well. You know, I was at Arsenal, yeah. I was at Liddyshaw. I didn't have to deal with any rejection at, at that point, but that was, that was a difficult moment for me really, was dealing with the stress factor in my back for, the, for three or four months. Mm. Um, and I guess when you're there, you're, you're standing on the sidelines, you're mm. seeing all of your, all of your um, friends, but also, I guess, competitors out there training. Yeah. What's going through your mind at that point? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's so difficult. Like you say, it's, it's hard. You're seeing them having fun. They're enjoying it. You're there on the sideline collecting the balls. or They're trying to keep you involved, but like, you, know, you, you are, but you're not. Yeah. You know, you, you, yeah. your friends are out there, they're enjoying it, they're coming in, they're talking about someone scoring a goal or a game they played on the weekend mm. and they've won and you're there, you're part of the squad, but you're not, you're not in the mix of it. Um, yeah. So it is, it is really difficult. It is really difficult, but you know, they were great with me in, in terms of helping me deal with it, my, you know, my friends and the, and the people at Lily Shore. But, but obviously then I got back, um, you know, and I feel, you know, even, even in the time I was back for... 12 to 12 to 18 months of, of my last time there. I think, you know, I'd done well and I think I progressed in that, in that time there. And mm-hmm. um, obviously then it was time to leave and, and decide where I wanted to go in, in terms of full-time football with, mm. with a YTS as, as it was back then. Mm, yeah, and so you'd be 16 then, presumably? 16, yeah, leaving school. So I was yeah. 16. I was still attached to Arsenal. Obviously, my last two years of school, I was, I was at Lily Shore, but I was still contracted to Arsenal. Yeah. And then I had to make a decision where I was going to start my professional career if you like mm. um arsenal did offer me a contract um but it was funny at the time because arsene wenger had just come into arsenal when i was 14 so when i went to lady he had just come in and you could see it was changing at arsenal he was starting to bring young players in from all around the world right from yeah. south america from europe which at that time wasn't really known it was more just your local boys or you mm. know lads from the uk whereas wenger come in and he was bringing in He's say the best players from from across the world at a young age, and I just decided when I left Lily Shore that maybe my pathway would be better elsewhere. Mm. Um, so I had a big decision, and that was a huge decision. I'd spent seven years at, at Arsenal from nine to sixteen. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was all I knew. I knew obviously a lot of people there, my teammates, the, the coach and stuff, and um, it was a big decision. But I decided to join West Ham. West Ham had just won the Youth Cup, which was a huge thing, and they had history of bringing in. Younger players, like at the time, Rio Ferdinand was in the first team. Frank Lampard was in the first team. And I just thought it was a better opportunity for me to go there and, and maybe try and work my way in the first team there as opposed to Arsenal, mm. which was a bigger, you know, Arsenal was a bigger club. But naturally, it was harder to get in the first team anyway. Yeah. But with them bringing in even more talent from a younger younger age across the world, um, I just thought West Ham was a, was a better choice for mm. me. And um, I decided to go there. So I left school and then I signed my... YTS were professional contract at a five year contract at West Ham. So it was new beginnings. Um, but luckily, I had Jermaine Defoe, who went to Lily Shaw with me. He left Charlton to join West Ham. I left Arsenal to join West Ham. So we kind of had each other. So I knew someone going into West Ham, which, which helped. Yeah, there's some pretty big names though that you've just thrown yeah. out there very <laughs> casually, Leon. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone listens going, wow, yeah. this is pretty cool, you know, at that age. Yeah. Really, to be in that, in that kind of group of those fantastic players. No, amazing. it was. Like you say, me and Jermaine was, was good friends. We went to the, re- like I say, the Lily Shore trials, the regional ones. He's a London boy. Obviously, I'm a London boy. Yeah. We, you know, we, we hit it off straight away in the regional trials to get to Lily Shore when we was like 13 or 14. And um, obviously, he became a, a great friend, said a great friend of mine. And it was, it was nice. Like you say, went from Lily Shore, left Arsenal, Jermaine left Charlton, went to, to West Ham together. And we was in the same boat because, it, because when I left Arsenal, it went to a tribunal as well. So they had to pay potentially 1.6 million um, for myself and 
I think it was about the same for Jermaine. So me and Jermaine mm. went as 16 year olds for big transfer fees, you know. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was quite a big thing um, at the time. Uh, so that was something to deal with. So it was nice that we was both in the same boat. We've both come, you know, for big transfer fees, if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, no. It was, he, I, as it worked out, he went on and played for West Ham and and done very well. Unfortunately, myself, I didn't quite make it. But it was nice to see a familiar face. And like I say, he's um he's an incredible talent. Yeah, yeah. And at that age, I mean, that's a lot of money, right? Like one point six yeah. million. And and it and it was a fair few years ago as well. Yeah. That's a lot of money today. But yeah. Back then, how the hell does a boy from Merton mm-hmm. growing up in a very, from what you've described, a very loving but sort of normal family? Yeah deal with that amount of money at that age and still be yeah. Leon yeah, it's, <laughs> without becoming really just kind of you know this majorly kind yeah. of out there arrogant yeah. how do you keep how do you keep steady in that scenario I, don't, I think it helps with my background like my you know my family are very humble you know the way they yeah. are I think I think that helps with you know with the family that I come from um and the way I was brought up I think that that helped me just keep my feet on the ground mm. but it no it's difficult because all of a sudden you're on the, you know, the back pages of newspapers and people talking about you and this, this transfer fee. And then yeah. that, that adds pressure because you go into the club and other people talking about you as this big money signing as a 16 year old. Yeah. Um, but I, I never really got sidetracked by that. I never really thought to myself at that time, oh, I've been bought for this amount or I'm worth this or, yeah. you know, I, I, it was just, it was just more the determination every day to, to want to make the first team so every day just train my best and not and not thinking not getting sidetracked by that stuff I think yeah. you, you keep your feet on the ground that was something out of my hands it's not I couldn't do nothing about whether they said it was one pound or ten million it's yeah. not something that I control all sure. I can control is what I do every day on the training pitch yeah. but I think like I say my upbringing helped me in, in terms of keeping humble keeping my feet on the ground and not getting carried away thinking oh I've been bought for this I've made it I've, yeah. I've, I've done it already and um that certainly wasn't the case. It was, it was more, let's get on the training pitch. Let's work hard. Let's show these people that, you know, they've, they've invested in me and, you know, yeah. it's the right thing to do. There's, a, there's quite a lot of things that you just said there, which I think uh, uh, will resonate for people listening, actually. So one is you, when you love what you do, but, but keep really clear and grounded on your purpose and why you're doing it. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, you didn't go into it for the money per se. That mm. kind of came as a byproduct yeah. of, of being good at, good at what you do. And just keeping grounded and, and then, as you say, having sort of pretty humble background. And, and, and I guess when you go home, being the youngest of four, yeah. isn't it, you said? Yeah. Did your brothers and sisters just kind of go, yeah, whatever, Leon. Yeah, they, <laughs> You're still the little shit in yeah. the family. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit like that. I mean, like you say, I was the youngest. In, but in fairness, I moved away from home at a young age. So yeah. even, when I, even when I joined West Ham, I, I lived in Diggs, then I bought a flat. So I... From 14 years old, I left home. But like you say, my my older you know uh, two brothers and sister, they were just like yeah, whatever. Like you know, <laughs> you know, it's like you come home and they're not bothered about. Don't give it the big one that you're worth for 1.6 million or whatever it is. They <laughs> yeah. so they like you say the, the family and and obviously your siblings keep your um keep your feet on the ground. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, I love this. This is great because uh, you know, as I say, it doesn't matter whether you're in business or sports or whatever. Actually, keep keeping focused on why you're doing it and, and not getting distracted yeah. by all the noise around yeah. and some of the nonsense. Um, it sounds easy to do, but it's not that easy. But I think that, yeah, I mean, you know, you're sitting here today, we're having a lovely conversation and you are incredibly humble about everything you've achieved. And I think that's credit to you, to be honest. Yeah, but like I say, I think when you're in that situation, you've just got to keep your focus, What you know, the mm. reason why you're here and, and, and why you've been bought for the amount of money you have or why yeah. you've achieved what you've achieved. You can't forget that what's got you to that point. Yeah there's no secrets it's just hard work and determination you know being dedicated to it every single day and that's that's what I was from 10 years old 11 years old going out and playing football on my own in the garden on my own for hours upon hours Mm. and sacrificing when you were younger you know when your friends were going out and you know chasing girls and drinking and smoking and and Mm. all the rest of it um saying I'm not doing it I'm going home or I'm not going out today I've got a game the next day and I think that's something that's so important even when you reach some success and that's why I've always had so much admiration for the top top players you know your Gerrards Lampards Rooney's all these guys they've made the money they've achieved so much but they still go again and they still go again yeah. and that dr- drive and determination um, and they don't get sidetracked like I say by the money by the fame by the 
media, by everything else. Mm. It's, you know, every day giving your best. And um, I think it's so important. And in, in, like I say, not just in sport, mm. in, in any walk of life, when you want to be successful, you've got to remain humble. You've got to be hardworking. They're the fundamentals, you know, and that's yeah. that's what gets you to, to, to where you want to be. Yeah, I think that's great advice to people listening, actually. And, I mean, I always think it's, it's relatively simple. It's not always easy. But if you've got the right belief... You've got a strong purpose as to yeah. why you're doing it, and you you take action every day. Then you will you will get yeah. there and you'll be successful. But actually, sometimes you can uh, get a bit blown off track. Um, and and to your to your point, then you were just talking about you know it, it, you have to work hard. And I think the thing is that people sometimes they see they see in public you know the success yeah. and the achievements, but what they don't see is five o'clock in the morning, yeah. peeing down with rain, at the training camp, when you don't yeah. feel like doing it, your body's screaming, you're crying out to stop. So they don't see all no. of the, the sacrifices that you make. How do you keep going when it is tough like that and you just don't feel like it? Mm. It is, I think, like you say, I think people see, I'm talking in football now on a Saturday, when you yeah. play well and you win it, and, then, and that's all they see. But what leads up into that... Yeah. Um, but you say, there's times when it's freezing cold and it's raining. But first of all, you're lucky. You're doing something you love. So yeah. you're playing football. It's, you know, it's not too bad, is it? First of all, I mean, you're doing something that you love and you're getting paid. Which, yeah. But it, I think it's just that determination. It's just that drive. Because also what you don't want to do is you go into a game on a Saturday. You don't want to be underprepared. Mm. So because you're on that platform and people are watching, millions of people are watching, your fans, the TV... And you want to make sure you prepare for that game. So if I drop off and I think, oh, it's raining out today, tell you what, hamstring's a little bit tight. I'm mm. going to stay in today. Mm. Two days in, three days in, or you're not giving it everything. When you plan a Saturday, then mentally, in your mind, you're thinking, I haven't prepared right for this. Right. For me personally, I like yeah. every day, I would train my hardest every single day from the minute I step out to the minute I go in. Was, was, I had to do that. Yeah. If I didn't do that, I'd go into the game on a Saturday and I'd, it would play in your mind. Yeah. Um, so that, say that option of failure, but like not training well in the week, going into a game, I didn't like that. So mm. that was why the, the determination was there and, and, and making sure I was, I would get out there, even if it was some knocks and bumps, mm. bruises, or the weather wasn't great or whatever it may be, um, was to make sure that it, it mentally prepared me and physically prepared me going into the game to, to give my best. Mm. So mm. I wouldn't like it you know, I wouldn't like to, to miss training sessions because of the weather or because oh, I don't really fancy it today. Yeah, yeah. But it is difficult. There, look, it, there's times it is difficult. It is difficult, you know, various reasons. It could be, you know, I had twin boys and it's difficult. You know, you didn't sleep well the night before and you're going into training and you're tired. And mm. But like you say, there's always that Saturday that's coming and you want to make sure that you're prepared fully 100% that you know you can go into that game with confidence of what you've done in the previous four or five days in the lead up Mm -hmm. to the game. And I think you're right, you know, fail, what's the saying? Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Um, Do you think some of that came from your upbringing? You talked, you know, about your mum, you know, working hard in the the market and then driving you here, there and everywhere to sort of really help you in those early days and that strong work ethic. Do you think that had something to do with it almost like, and being the youngest in the family as Mm. well, I don't know whether there's anything that's sort of sitting there in the back of your mind that's sort of motivating you forward in that sense? No, I think, like you say, I think the upbringing of my mum and dad was... Like just say just working class, you know. Yeah. Worked hard. Very, you know, mum out in the morning. I'd be going to school. Mum had already have left, and she was you know up early at the crack of dawn, and then like, say taking me to to training. So that that upbringing, that background of hard work. Mm. Um, you know, family come from a council estate. You know, lived in a council estate, and obviously worked hard, and then was able to you know to buy a house, have four children. But um, I probably was fortunate in a way. I was being the youngest because maybe if I was the oldest or the middle. Maybe mum couldn't take me to, to yeah. training as such, you know. So I, I guess there's a little bit of fortune in, in terms of, of that. But the actual background and, and the upbringing was, like I say, a loving family, and a really hard-working family, which, um, you know, my mum couldn't say, I'm not going to work because I don't fancy it. It's raining out, it's pitch black. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to drive to Vauxhall. I don't want to do that. She had to go because, you know, she had to get money and, you know, and feed yeah. us, you know. So... <laughs> If you said to my mum, I'm not going to train because it's raining out, um, I don't fancy it, you know, you can imagine how that would go down. And she would, 
<laughs> you know, you get, well, what about me when I was, you know, having to, to go out in the, early in the morning? So the upbringing, obviously, yeah. it, it does help and it, it does help your mindset as you, as you grow older. Keeps you true. Keeps yeah. You, keeps you true and grounded. I love that. And then let's talk about Swansea because, as you say, you spent a huge amount of time when you moved over to Swansea and um, sort of the majority of your playing career here. So, um, yeah, highs, lows, yeah. how that's been for you and, and where you are now. Yeah, well, it, obviously I was at West Ham from 16... Like I said, I, I left for a, a big transfer fee and I was, the hope was I was going to break through into West Ham's first mm. team and have a successful career there. But um, as time went by, you know, I was 19, 20, Jermaine Defoe had gone into the first team, played lots of games. I was still in the reserves, mm. not following the same path, if you like, as, as maybe Jermaine. Um, I just wanted to play football. And I could see it didn't look like it was going to happen at West Ham. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to play professional football. And I still had another two years left in my contract, I think. And I spoke to West Ham and said, look, I want to go on loan. I want to, all right, basically, I want to try and show you. Let me go on loan. Let yeah. me go and perform somewhere. Go and play. You can watch me. And hopefully you can say, right, he's done well there. Come right. back to West Ham and, yeah. and we go from there. So he said, fine, try and get a club that would be interested. I couldn't get a club, like, if I'm being honest. No one would take me on loan. I went to Southend on trial for two weeks. Um, they said, oh, we do like you, but you're not going to play. Um, so I went back to West Ham. And mm. then someone at West Ham, Steve Shaw, said, um, we got a phone call from Brian Flynn at Swansea. They want to want you to go down and go down for a trial. Right. I said, no, but I didn't know much Where's about... Swansea? Yeah, I didn't know much about... <laughs> I knew it was Wales. I knew it was Wales and I didn't know much about... I didn't know much about the football club. If I'm being honest, I didn't know much about the history of the club. I didn't know much about the area. All I knew was it was in Wales. Yeah. Um, and I drive in the car down the M4 and it's just never ending. I mean, it's, <laughs> I do it a lot now because my daughter lives in London. And it, 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 you never get tired. That drive is just, it's just so far. And you get, it's funny because I drove down in November, um, late November, I think it was. And it was obviously dark when I, when I got towards Swansea and, Anyone who's drove to Swansea in, in the night and you see Potawa on your left hand oh, side, it's grim, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know you're not far away, and you, you do think, "What am I coming yeah, to? Yeah, where where am I? Where, yeah. where where am I? Where am I going?" Yeah. Um, but in fairness, and I, obviously, I, I got to Swansea. I met Brian Flynn, had a couple of weeks on trial, played a couple of games. Fortunately, he, he liked what he saw, and yeah. I initially signed for one month's uh, loan, so I was only meant to be here for a month and see how it goes. Played a couple of games in the first team. Within two games, I think it was maybe two or three games. I think they extended the loan to the, the end of the season. So I signed in December, and it was it was to the end of the season. And um, I enjoyed the that season so much. It was it, it was what I wanted to be. It was a professional. It was like coming home and see C facts or like the newspaper and picking it up and mm. seeing your name, you know, in the Swansea team. And that's that the first time you know I've I've been fortunate. I've played in some great games and some great occasions but my first ever game for Swansea was was a cold December day in Exeter away and there was maybe 2,000 fans or something but for me it was like one of my favourite moments in my career it was like all that hard work when we're talking about yeah. from 8 years old 9 years old the sacrifices going to Liddyshaw and everything and when you actually hear the whistle blow and you, you're playing professional football and this is it this is like you feel like you, you've made it but this is yeah, I'm a professional yeah. I can call myself a, a professional footballer and um that six months, Swansea was going through a, a really rough period. We was, we was bottom of Division Four, if you like, um, League Two as it is now. And um, Swansea had never dropped out of the Football League before, so it was it was a huge season, and um, it was an incredible experience for me to have my first season in, as such as a, a professional player, where we, we ended up having to play Hull City on the last game of the season mm. in two thousand and three. To if we won the game, we stayed in in the Football League. If we lost, depending on on Exeter's result we might have gone down, but fortunately we won the game 4-2 and um, six months on loan was, was, was brilliant. You know, I, I, I loved the city. I loved, you know, everything about it. You know, even though the, the, the team was struggling as such and it was, it was a difficult period for the football club. For me, it was like mm. I was on cloud nine. I was playing every week in front of crowds. Um, I just absolutely loved it. And, and my, my loan spell had finished. Obviously, we beat, um, we beat whole city 4-2, which was still to this to the, to, to, today was um, one of the, the most historic moments in the, in the career mm. um, but then I finished at Swansea on that loan move and then we had to decide what was going to happen I had a year left at West Ham right 
it was either go back to West Ham, hopefully they, they give me the opportunity, or what I didn't want to do was have that experience of playing first team football and going back to reserve team football. And, mm. and then West Ham said to me, um, that was free to go, basically. I could, right. I could leave. And, and I said, I didn't want to speak to any other clubs. Swansea gave me the opportunity when, when no one else would. Yeah. And I think there would have been more options for me, if I'm being honest, because I won player of the year at Swansea in that six months and things had gone well and there probably would have been more opportunities. But mm. for me, I felt they took me on when no one else would. So I wanted to repay them and I signed, I think it was a two-year contract. And then that was the start of my full-term um, contract with Swansea. Then. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and I guess there's something here about finding your tribe, yeah. finding the right environment for you yeah. to flourish. Yeah. And, and like you say, you know, it, the timing kind of worked because even though the club was struggling, it allowed you to flourish and, and probably actually to... to to kind of gain your confidence when if the club had been absolutely thriving and you'd come in, then maybe the pressure would have been yeah. different and maybe, you know, uh, actually sometimes things happen for a reason. And, uh, you know, when you talk about Swansea, your face lights <laughs> up. I mean, literally, you know, you can just see the passion and the energy that you've got, which like, is I, wonderful. Honestly, I, I just felt so at home from the first moment yeah. I, I come to Swansea, like the supporters, not just the supporters of, of the football club, but the people of the city coming from London, very fast pace, you know, getting the tube to train in in the morning at West Ham and, you know, anyone who travels in London, it's the sardines in the can on the tube and people yeah. rushing past and no one's got, you ask someone for the time, they ain't got the time of day for you. They just, mm. poof, you come to Swansea, all of a sudden as a young boy, you're queuing up for your shopping or something and someone turns around and starts talking to you, <laughs> not knowing that you're even a footballer, you know, just, oh, you know, the weather's nice today or whatever. And you just, yeah. you're just a bit taken back by how friendly everyone was. And it was, um, it was amazing, really. Like I say, not just the, the, the football club, but I found the people so welcoming. Because, um, yeah. you know, still a young lad, um, moving, a, moving away as such was, was, a, big, was a big step. But um, for me, like I say, it was a no-brainer. Signed the contract, signed the two-year contract and um, just wanted to get back down to it. And I really, really enjoyed it. Brilliant. So obviously Swansea as a club had kind of you know had its ups and downs, mm. um, and I I was at the Wembley game actually in the playoffs. Oh yeah, which was 2011. 2011, yeah. Yes, um, and I mean that was just incredible, an yeah. incredible moment. Um, and even though I'm not from Swansea, my beloved other half is a Swansea Jack, as yep. they say. And I remember walking around Wembley and just literally Chris sort of almost letting on to like every other yeah. person it was like it was like half of the city was in Wembley oh. it was incredible but just talk me through that that I'm getting goose pimples mm. now actually thinking back to it but just talk me through as a player knowing what was at stake um in that playoff against Reading you know how yeah. what's going through your mind before you come out on the pitch yeah. how did it how does it work for I you? mean <laughs> yeah I mean that, that day was incredible in terms of what it meant to the football club and and for myself as well, there was there was three of us: me, Alan Tate, Gary Monk, uh, were three players in that squad who'd been part of the League Two team. So we'd come through all the divisions. We'd seen mm. the club on its knees as such, struggling um, in the bottom of League Two, and we'd seen the progression of the club move into a you know a fantastic stadium in the Liberty Stadium, promotion and promotion, and then you get to Wembley and it's this one-off game which is. A defining moment in so many people's career, the football club. Um, it was an incredible day. Um, the game against Red in the playoff final. I think. Let's say there was there was f three of us in that squad: myself, Alan Tate, Gary Monk, who had come from League Two, where the club was was on its knees, struggling mm. financially in a really bad place. Um, to eight years time in a new stadium, having two promotions behind us, going into in the championship, and then obviously going into this playoff final. It was. An incredible journey, and there we was in this one game at Wembley, where <laughs> everyone dreams of play. You know, say everyone, but as a young uh, English boy, Wembley was yeah. you know, was where everyone dreamed when you're in the park, you're playing at Wembley or whatever. Yeah. And here you are at Wembley with an opportunity of achieving a dream, which was to get to the Premier League, because that's where we'd all strive to to get to. Um, and at the time, I was, I think, 28 at the time. Mm. So from eight years old playing football in my primary school, it's taken me 20 years to have this opportunity of yeah. getting to the top, which is what I've always wanted to do. And to go into that 
with a club that meant so much in terms of Swansea was was a huge moment. But I remember that the day we we stayed in the hotel with the team meeting. Obviously, then you get on the bus and um, as we approach Wembley at the new stadium, you have to, the, the bus drops down under the stadium. Mm. But I remember as we as we approached and we, we go to this tunnel, literally black and white. It was honestly, it was like 20,000 fans just welcoming us. It was the hairs in the back of your neck standing yeah. up when you look up and you, and you you realise how much it means and how far we've come. Like, you know, as a football club, how far we've come that we could bring 40,000 40, Swansea fans to Wembley, sell our allocation. Um, whereas when I first come, we was getting maybe 2,000 fans, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's night and day from where we was and, and where we potentially was going to be. And um, I just, it was, you know, it was an incredible day. It was, you know, you step out on the Wembley pitch as the game started, we, we couldn't have asked for a better, you know, a better first half. We were three nil up at half time. I mean, you just couldn't ask. If you asked someone, it would be the dream scenario, you know, three nil up. And the funny thing was in, a, in the changing room, trying to keep focused, you know, we're trying yeah. to say, look, it's nil nil. We're not winning. Treat it as that mentality. When we got the second half, it's nil nil. We've not achieved anything. Um, but then we come out the second half and before you know it, we're free to yeah. they score two quick goals and, and then we are literally hanging on. We are hanging on and um, there's an important moment in the game. They, were, they hit the post, someone had a shot, it rebounded out, their player had an open goal and Gary Monk blocked uh, the shot and went out for a corner and that was at 3-2. I, th- I think if that goes in and it goes 3-3, free free, I think the way the game was panning out, it would have been a red and would have gone on and won the game I'm, mm. I'm sure but we rode the storm a little bit after 3-2 and that and that miss and then we got the fourth goal and then um, afterwards it was just oh, it was it was just incredible the scenes with let's say with the players who have been together a lot of us have been together a long time um, with 40,000 Swansea fans there yeah. achieving a dream yeah. at Wembley it was just um, it was just it was just incredible it's it's the best moment in my career um, yeah. w- without a doubt um, it really really was and you know to get to the Premier League at 28 with Swansea was was incredible yeah no I can imagine that being a major highlight like you say you know 20 years to get from, yeah. from where you were as a kid playing football to, to that yeah. pinnacle point in, incredible yeah Fantastic. like you say you worked so hard yeah. from 8 years old to to be a professional but obviously you want to be at the top we yeah, all watched the Premier League or Division 1 or what it was back then and yeah. that's where you wanted to get to so to achieve it and I knew then next season I'll be in the Premier League as a, mm. as a Premier League player after all that hard work and them sacrifices and it it made everything worth it all the times you missed out on things and like you say when you've had to go out in the pouring rain and we've had to yeah. <laughs> Swansea we're driving around in our cars trying to find somewhere to train you know climbing through fences to train somewhere and all this kind of stuff yeah. um, it made every second of it worth it oh fabulous fantastic so massive celebrations yeah. that day yeah. that's for sure I remember oh my god um, and then of course it's quite a long period after that where you where you, you were still at Swansea yeah because um, it was when did you actually finally finish at Swansea what year was I finished that? in 2018 so 18, it's coming up yeah. to three years yeah three years this May yeah yeah and so so that transition let's talk a little bit about kind of when you knew the time was right to go yeah um you know having been you know professional footballer all those years and you've given your life and soul to to the game right um how did you know it was the right time for you to finish I think towards the end of my career um probably like when I was probably from 32 onwards I started to pick up a lot more niggling injuries right um not not you know I'm not talking about long-term injuries I'm just talking about little muscle injuries calf injuries Mm. um and I'd be in the you know in the gym doing rehab with the physios for two weeks I'd be back out train for a couple of weeks something else would go Mm. and I think towards the end of my career like I, I retired at 35 but probably for the for the last 12 to 18 months I could see my body just couldn't take it at that level no more. I right. think I'd push my body from such a young age every day, constantly, constantly, um, that I think it was just saying to me, look, I can't cope. Like, at this, especially at that level, mm. you're at the, the, the highest level where you've got to be at it every single day. Like I said before, like every day I trained, I, I, I trained my hardest. And I think my body was just saying, 
I can't do it no more. I'm, mm. you know, I'm breaking down. And um, so I kind of knew I signed the contract, I think when I was 34 for 12 months. And I, I knew then that was going to be my last season. I knew with, with the way my body was reacting. And also I, I didn't want to just stay at Swansea for the sake of staying at Swansea. I didn't want people to remember me. Yeah. At the end of my career thinking, oh, he wasn't the same. Mm. I didn't want to outstay my welcome. I, you know, I wanted to be able, I, if I couldn't do what I used to be able to do, I didn't want to, I still thought I could affect games, but yeah. like I say with the injuries and probably, you know, your mobility starts to wane a little bit, obviously, naturally mm. as you get older. And I just didn't want to stay at the club and be that player that people remember and say, oh, them last two years, he yeah. was a shadow of the player that he was when he was yeah. 28 or whatever, like, you know. Yeah. And, and, not, and obviously my body was telling me. So for me, it was pretty clear. It was, I'm not saying it was easy. I don't think it's ever easy to to make that decision because it's all you've ever known and it's mm. it's something that you love doing every single day but but I knew it was the, I think as players and I sp- I've spoke to a few players since I finished and I said only you know when it's the right time yeah I said people might say oh you're a bit young or you can do this and, and but I said they're not walking in your shoes you know if maybe you fell out of love with the game or for whatever yeah. reason you, you, you don't want to carry on but I said you know when it's the right time and for me I knew it was the right time and I decided you know, at the end of that season when I was 35 that, uh, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to finish my, my football career and, you know, I was happy with, with what I achieved and, and everything I'd given. I couldn't give any more really, to be honest with you. Mm. And it was just, like I say my body was just breaking. It was just like, even now you feel the effect, you know, three years on, two and a half, three years on and go for a run. Next day, my back stiff, you're struggling to put your shoes on or you do yeah. your laces up because yeah. you just pushed your body, the injections after injections when you know, maybe you shouldn't train, you do train, and just, your body does take a battering. So I yeah. think um, it was not easy, but I think it was it was clear for me it was the right time. Yeah. And how, how getting your mind around all of that, so obviously it's not just a, a light bulb moment, it's it's happening over a period mm. of time as you're sort of noticing these knocks that are coming through and what have you. How important was it to have people around you to help you with that decision? Yeah. Um, or was it something that you just had had to process yourself and, like you said, get get your own sort of head in yeah. good shape about it? How, how did that imp- impact? Um, I think obviously, you know, my wife Laura. You know, you're at home, you're speaking with her regular, and she helps with that transition. I think it helps that I had that I knew in my head really that I was going to retire in maybe ten, eleven months. So mm. it gave me. It wasn't like a career-ending injury no. from one day to the next, and it was gone. And it was yeah. like. I knew I had time to to get myself ready, say financially, but get things in place for me that I knew when I finished that it'd mm. give me, you know, I'd be in the best possible position I could be to retire. But it was just more dealing with it myself, really. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, I've got family, I've got, you know, my wife, my mum and dad and, and everyone else. But I think it's more just dealing with it yourself. Um, yeah. Just trying to savour every moment as well. Being in that changing room, knowing that, it's difficult, you know, in, in two months' time, three months' time or whatever it is. This is the last time, you know, you pull that shirt on for the last time thinking, yeah. shit, this is the last time I'm going to put the shirt on, I'm going to walk out the tunnel, I'm going to play in front of these supporters who have been so good with me. Mm, mm. Uh, it, it's just adjusting and getting ready for that. But I think I, it does help that I knew that it was coming. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I could, I could get ready for it as opposed to it being a, a big shock to the system. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. So kind of get your get your house in order a yeah. little bit, get your head in good shape, put some practical stuff there, yeah. so that when you make the transition out, because I think it must be very difficult. I mean, you know, in the world of sports in particular, where you are performing at that elite level for so long, and then I guess for some sports people, obviously they haven't thought about that mm. transition out, and then it's like, oh my god, you know, what the hell do I do now? Yeah. And that that sort of stark contrast can be quite. Difficult to deal with emotionally, I, I expect. I think, yeah, I think a lot of players or people, sports people, suffer after. You know, mm. they, 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 I think with football, you know why, where you are every day. You're living your life for football, your diet, um, your training. <laughs> yeah. Everything is based around your football life and making sure you're right for the Saturday or whenever you, you know, whatever game you, you play. So coming out of that and all of a sudden, it is difficult. You can see why a lot of ex-players suffer with say mental health but you know yeah. all of a sudden they're like whoa what do I do now like mm. I don't have to be here or what what, what am I, what I going to do and mm. um, it, it, it is tough I think fortunately for me I, I went back into the club as a, as a club ambassador so I was still involved and I knew, I knew 
finishing as a player, I'll, I'll be going back into into the club and working. But if you haven't got that option um, and you you haven't got that next job, if you like, mm. it's difficult. You're waking up in the morning and thinking, well, what am I going to do? Yeah. You know, I don't have to go training. I, I can eat what I want. I can drink what I want. I can. And then sometimes the players like having the schedule and being a bit more regimented and knowing, and that's what we've lived with all our lives, you know, and all of a sudden when it changes, yeah, you can see maybe where some players go off the rails and all of a sudden maybe they, their diet, they, mm. you know, they, they put on a lot of weight or they're drinking in excess and it's, it's really tough. Um, but we're fortunate in thought we've got the PFA who can, can help players, you know, when, whether you're a past player or a present player and any problems, mm. but you can see why there's a lot of mental health issues with, with players who come out of football. Yeah, yeah. And I guess anyone that's making a big change, you know, if, if, if you're trying to move from transition from one thing to another, that it's not always that easy, you know, whether it's in business or life or, you know, leaving a relationship, yeah. starting a new relationship, you know, there's stuff happens along the way, doesn't it, that can be quite, quite a stark contrast yeah. from maybe where you were. Um, what advice would you give to anyone, whether it's in the sports world or business world or someone that actually is has been in a field for a long time like you were and is thinking of making that change? If you were to give them any advice, what would you say? I think uh, for me, what worked for me was was being able to plan for the future, knowing what was coming up. Yeah. Um, you know, knowing that I was going to be finishing and, and getting things ready. So it made it a bit more of a, I say, a smoother transition, knowing that, I was comfortable with what I was doing and I was going to finish and I had things in place, like you say, to, to help me with that. I think, mm. it, it's, I think that would be my advice. If you can, obviously, like circumstances dictate differently. You know? sure, so sure. It's, I was fortunate I was able to do that. But if you know maybe that the timing is right for you in whatever, you, whatever you're doing, having the idea and that to make the transition as smooth as possible and putting things mm. in place and um, being able to do that, I think, I think that was a massive help. I think... You know, if things changed overnight for me, I, I might have struggled. Yeah. Um, but for sure, being able to have that process of knowing what was coming in in, in a period of time and getting myself ready and, and, and set for that, I think definitely helped me for sure. And I think, mm. you know, that would be my advice to people with, you know, whatever walk of life you're in is to, if you can, just have that in mind. Yeah, no, that's great advice, actually, because um, sometimes I think people do struggle is where do I start almost defining what that next thing is, yeah. you know. Um, and, and obviously, you've, you're now doing some quite interesting stuff in property, yeah. uh, which we were talking about earlier, which is great. So that's obviously one, one thing that you've got going. Um, what else? What else? What's next? And we had this conversation <laughs> yeah. offline where everyone asks you, what next? What next to Leon? And yeah. that sometimes that creates a pressure and you're thinking, my God, I'm just enjoying this moment actually with everything yeah. I've got going on. So maybe I shouldn't ask that <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, where's, where's your thinking around the next phase of your life yeah. for you, Laura, the kids and what have you? Well, I mean, like you say, I, at the moment, I, you know, I, I was fortunate, like I say, towards the end of my career, I was able to buy some commercial properties, mm. which is something... You know, I had great advice from from Martin Morgan, who yes. Martin who advised me. You know, coming towards the end of my career, you know, give me some advice. Obviously, someone who's, who's very successful and decided to buy some properties and invest in that, which is which has been great. It's kept me busy. It's mm. it's um, been a completely different outlook to obviously what I've been used to in terms of football. And yeah. all of a sudden, you're a landlord and you're dealing with um, commercial tenants and leases and buying properties and problems with properties and especially with the, the pandemic and everything. So that's been a great learning curve, if you like. So that's, yeah. that's kept me busy. Um, but like you say, when I always bump into people and people <laughs> say, so when are you get back into football, what are you going to do? Senior, <laughs> senior, senior players, younger players, scouting. Um, and you're almost like, I think we're saying downstairs, you feel a bit pressured. Like, you know, yeah. it's, it's a little bit like, well, I don't know yet. Like, I'm not 100% sure what direction I'm, I'm going to go, whether it's, whether it is football, whether it's business or whether, mm. you know, mm. um, I haven't said this is what I'm doing, but you do feel that pressure a little bit when you, <laughs> when you speak to people and they, I guess it's natural that they, you've been involved, especially at the Swans for so long, yes. 17, 18 years, people automatically assume that, what, you're not going to be going back into Swansea? Like, you know, you're not going to, yeah. you know, and so it's natural for them to think that, but at the moment, obviously I'm, I'm just enjoying my time. It's been obviously a difficult year for everyone with, with the yeah. pandemic and, unusual times um but I've enjoyed it you know I've obviously spent so much time with, with the children and, and mm. Laura in, in this last 12 months which is something I was never able to do being a 
being a professional footballer and being away from home a lot, dedicating your life to the, to the sport. Um, but in, in moving forward, like I said, I've, I've not made yeah. a decision that I'm going down this route on, or everyone's different. Look, I, I had an ex-teammate, Gary Monk, he was 33 years old or 33, 34, knew he wanted to be a football manager. He'd mm. become Swansea manager at 34, 35 maybe. And he yeah. knew that was what he wanted to do, which yeah. is yeah. which is great. Some people have that idea straight away. They know which route they want to go down or they don't want to be involved in football. They want to do something else. Yeah. With me, it's a little bit of, I think, still deciding, still yeah. deciding yeah. Um, which route to go down. And I think that's, that, that, that actually is refreshing to hear, you know, because I think a lot of people don't necessarily know mm. what's next. And, and that's all right. Yeah. And, you know, and I think sometimes we can put pressure on ourselves by comparing ourselves to others or, you know, I always think some really damaging words or what will people say and what yeah. will people think, you know. And, and actually, you have to put that to one side, I think, yeah. and follow your own path and what's right for you at whatever time that'll be. And that clarity will will evolve and yeah. emerge at, at a pace that's right for yeah. you, won't it? Yeah. And uh, actually, it's no one else's business, you know, what you <laughs> to, But I think where, you're, where you've been in the, say, the public eye, you do become, you know, people do want to know, like, you know, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you're bumping into people when you're going to of the course. shop and they want to know, so, oh, so what are you doing now then? Like, you yeah. know, and they just ask it. So yeah. like, sometimes if you're someone else, you might be able to deal with it yeah. see it out in the public eye but in Swansea it's such yeah, a course. small place you know people yeah. naturally want to know what you're doing yeah. and um, like you say it will come in time um, when you decide what you do want to do but yeah. um, you do feel that pressure you do feel people maybe thinking oh what, he's, he wants to do that or he's not doing this and yeah. <laughs> like you say and then you start to think that but you just like you say you've got to decide you've got to be comfortable with what you're doing absolutely and you've got to be comfortable to decide when's the right time and whatever you want to do Forget what other people say. Forget what other people think. It's yeah. what you want to do. It's your life. Absolutely. It's your life and your family's life. It's not, you know, who cares what John down the road thinks that you've decided to do. It's, yeah. well, if I want to do that, then I'm going to do that, you know. Yeah, no, that's brilliant advice, actually, for anyone listening. That's, like, really, really cool. And, yeah, absolutely. You, you only have one life, right? Yeah. So make it, make it count yeah. and do what's going to make you happy and yeah. fulfilled, whatever it might be. But the, thing, the great thing for you is you've got so many options, which is yeah. lovely. So you, you're not going to be short of, short of things to spend your time on. That, 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 that's yeah. 100%. But um, we will be watching with great anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't ask a question again yeah. <laughs> next time I see you, I won't ask you the yeah. question um, so just to close just to finish up then can you think of the best piece of advice that you've been given by anyone when you look back over your illustrious career or just to, I mean you've probably had loads of pieces of advice but yeah. anything that stands out um, it's difficult really I think to say one piece of advice for me it was all, like I said to you before it was always about hard work and everything you do is, mm. is that determination and um, every single day giving it your best in, in whatever you choose to do but there was one thing maybe someone at Lily Shaw Tony Pickering said he was the guy who looked after us he said um, be kind to the people on the way up because you never know when you'll need them on the way down you know and um, I, th- I think it's just remaining humble having that respect for everyone working hard um, it, like I say it's difficult to give one piece of advice but for me that's what's worked for me in my life yeah um, dealing with setbacks and and everything along the way is just it's just working hard every single day yeah brilliant advice and um yeah you can see how that's absolutely been a thread through your whole life actually and your career so yeah. uh, that's that's great advice so this podcast is called brave bold brilliant which you clearly are yeah. <laughs> well, actually, you wouldn't be here having a conversation um but what does that mean to you if someone said to you what does brave bold brilliant mean to you what, how does Ooh. it how does it manifest it in your mind? <laughs> um, brave, I think brave is just for me is like choosing something in your life that you want to do and, and, and going with it, mm. and backing it, being brave. Don't for me, don't listen to what other people say. Like we said, be brave in your choices in your in your life, whether it's personal, business, whatever it may be. Mm. Um, be bold. Take for me is you know take opportunities when they come along. Mm. Um, don't be scared of, of taking the opportunities uh, like we said you, you only live once in life so you've got to be bold you've got to make decisions and, and, and go with them and believe in what, in what you're doing and brilliant um, just be brilliant in everything you do I think you know that's that's what you can say really is anything you choose to do in, in like I say whether it's work or personal life um, just give it everything and be brilliant in what you, you choose to do in your life 
Oh, that is amazing. Thank you so much, Leon. Yeah, I've, I've loved our conversation. I could have sat here for hours. <laughs> Same <here. laughs> But no, I really appreciate you coming on. And no thank problem. you for all your time and energy and enthusiasm. No, so, well, thanks for having me. Oh, I really enjoyed it. Really great yeah. stuff. Thank you. No problem.